secondly, the equally lovely and just as wonderful Charlotte Stewart. Yay! Yay! So what I'd like to start off with is, um, Catherine and Charlotte, you both, both work with David Lynch on Eraserhead. Yes. Oh, okay. I'm going to get my key light. Wait, sure, I'll, if I sit back. There we go. There you go. So my, my husband says that when our garage light goes on, I think about. <laughs> <laughs> so I just wanted to ask you both how you first met David, how the experience of, was of working on Eraserhead, because obviously it was a fairly epic filmmaking process. Yes, go ahead. Okay, I'll go first. Um, my roommate at the time was uh, working as a, as a volunteer assistant at the um, American Film Institute in Beverly Hills. And she came home one day and she said, I'm working on this movie, uh, one of the student films is called Eraserhead. And I'm working with Jack Fisk, who's an art director. And um, the director's David Lynch and he's looking for an actress to play in this movie. And I told him, hey, my roommate's an actress. So <laughs> David and his wife at the time came over to my house. And David, as a, a good guest, brought me a, a house gift, which was a sack of wheat seed. <laughs> because I lived in the country and I guess David assumed that you know this would come in very handy to me. <laughs> and uh, we sat down, had a lovely dinner, he brought me a script, um, which was about that thick. And uh, we just talked, you know, over dinner. And then he left and I read the script and I was completely baffled. I didn't understand any of it. But, you know, I was an actress and, and I have a responsibility to work with student filmmakers. I always did, you know, when anybody asked me, I would always say, sure, you know, and they usually were one or two days. I didn't know this was going to be four years, <laughs> but, um, you know, once you're in it, you're in it. And uh, so he, he cast me as Mary X. And, um, I seem to remember that one of the important criteria for the person playing Mary was that she could cry well. Do you remember that? Yes. And you cried. Did you cry for him, or he oh. just—he knew you could cry. He knew I could cry, and uh, I think in the dinner scene. Oh God, that took a long time. Um, we, and the other thing is, David only liked to shoot at night, so we might start at ten o'clock at night and shoot all night. And I remember the first day we shot was the dinner scene. You know, with the little man-made chicken. No. <laughs> They're just like real chickens. Oh, yeah. Okay. You just, just cut them up like just cut them up like real chickens. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and I think I had to cry through the entire thing, and it was it took us like what four days yeah. or five days <laughs> to shoot it, and I was just wrung out by the end of that, and I thought, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> ah, but I think he did. <laughs> I used to say that I was the handmaiden to genius when we were working on the film. I originally met David because I was teaching an acting class to the directing fellows at the American Film Institute. And David came to two of them because they were in the morning and he never showed up again. But he, he remembered Jack Nance, who, to whom I was married at the time, in my early 20s, a lovely, <laughs> lovely actor. She did and, hair too. And, and he, um, he told me that this guy had told him about this film and we should go over to his house. And so we went to David's house and talked to him for a while. And he asked me if I would consider playing the nurse who gives Mary and Henry the baby. And I hadn't read the script and I said, sure, because you know, I'm an actor. I'll be happy to do that. And he asked Jack Nance, um, you know, a few questions, but didn't really audition anybody, and he still, to this day, doesn't audition actors. He just sits and talks to them. So we went outside David's house, and he had built this Volkswagen rack, like on a little Volkswagen Beetle. He had built his own rack, and Jack said, boy, that is a really cool rack. And then David said he knew that he was going to cast Jack. <laughs> as, as he raised him. And so uh, we started off by doing some scenes in the set, which was in the uh, 
stables of the American Film Institute, which was an old estate in Beverly Hills. And we just kind of rehearsed in these empty rooms. And he would ask me if I would mind coming and timing the scene. When we started shooting the movie, because I was married to Jack and because David wanted the hair done a certain way, I was the only person that Jack would allow to back comb his hair. <laughs> so David designed it and, and we cut it and then I had to keep maintaining it for four years, which was why we weren't married by the end of the day. <laughs> but I also started helping out because we were waiting to shoot the nurse scene by um, doing a little lighting, a little cooking, a little dolly pushing, a little booming with the mic, a little bit of everything, and finally some fundraising at the end to make the film get finished. And by the time we got to the time where Mary would be given the baby, we decided not to do that scene. So the only scene that I actually filmed as an actor is no longer in the movie, which is when I was tied to a bed next door by some black battery cables wearing a slip and um, the uh, guy next door comes in with these battery cables to do something and Mary, I mean, and Judith, the, wo the beautiful woman across the hall, hears a sound just as Henry's about to kiss her. Do you remember that scene? Anyway, that was the cutaway to this scene of, of myself and another actor tied to a bed. My parents were really happy that it wasn't in the movie. <laughs> but I'm always sorry to say that I'm actually not in the film, but I definitely was part of the Handmaiden to Genius crowd. And of course, we became really good friends for many, many years. And during the time of shooting Eraserhead is when David asked me, if how I felt about uh, Ponderosa Pine. And he had this idea for a television series called I'll Test My Log with Every Branch of Knowledge. And he wanted me to take the log, this Ponderosa Pine, um, to different experts. And for example, we'd take it to a dentist, and the dentist would put a little blue clippy um, thing around it, a little towel, and it would probe, the dentist would probe the, the rings of the log. And then, we would learn about the log and about dentistry. <laughs> so that's where he got the idea for the log, the log girl. This would be the log girl because I wore glasses at night when we were shooting and little plaid skirts. And so that's where he got the idea. Then years and years and years later, he called and said, you know, are you ready to do the log girl? <laughs> and uh, I've got a series, at the, I've got a pilot to do it at ABC, at the American Broadcasting Corporation, and would you be interested in doing it? And I said, yes, but I don't think we can call her the log girl anymore. <laughs> so that's the story. But Eraserhead was pivotal for all of us because we worked on it for four years. We thought no one would ever see it. We made a lot of jokes about Jack Nance's hair and how someday people would wear their hair like that, but it was a total joke. And look what happened. And here we are with you. It's just great. Julie, you first worked with David and Angela Badalamenti recording Mysteries of Love. No, nope, David oh, wasn't really? there. Oh, okay. No. But you recorded that song for Yeah, it was just Angelo and I. Actually, right. I was in the worst, the worst musical theater uh, show I'd ever been in. It was called Boys in the Live Country Band. And Angelo was the musical director. It was the first time I hit New York. And I was a professional French horn player. But I'd been, I decided to put that down. I was with the Chicago Symphony and you know, go to Minneapolis and become an actor and um, get my graduate degree and then move on to New York and just take it by storm, and I was there. <laughs> and um, four years after the awful show, I got a pink slip of paper from the doorman at my, uh, where I lived on the Upper West Side in Manhattan. And it said, Angelo called, call me. Uh, Andy called, His, he was called Andy Badali. And he was a tunesmith in Nashville. And Angelo Badalamente would not have cut it. <laughs> yep. No way. Um, so he was Andy Badali to me for a very long time. And I was, you know, I'm a belter. I'm a big belter. I have a big voice. And I was, um, and I'm a comedian and an actress and, I, uh, and a musician. And 
Um, but I'm not an ingenue. I am not an ingenue. And I, but I was looking for all kinds of singers to sing this damn song. And I have tapes of auditions of people coming in for him. And um, I don't think that he had, he didn't quite know what to do. And I just thought in my head, maybe it had something to do with Isabella. Because I know they brought Angelo in for the Italian to help her because she was very, very nervous. And uh, I was a talent scout. And so finally I got really frustrated. And I've done a children's scholastic um, uh, magazine type recording with Angelo, Andy. And um, uh, it was just like, I'm gonna put that button in the buttonhole. <laughs> uh, that kind of stuff. And um, uh, <laughs> that led to, just let me do it. And I'll show you, I'll show you. And I sang um, Mysteries of Love. And the strings weren't even on it. And Angelo had come back from, before I'd even, had done all this. Angelo had come back with this napkin and uh, scrawled letters, notes on it, and those were the lyrics for the song and the mood. Mood. 